I think I know most of you, but I'm Marguerite Welch. I teach in the Masters of Arts and Leadership program, and our program is um, a hybrid program. Um, we meet probably, our uh, classes meet in person on weekends, and then we're online for six, seven weeks, and then we meet in person on a weekend to end the class. So that's the structure. So we do a lot of the asynchronous work and we do a lot of work with discussion forums and we set the discussion forums up as the way of um they're like they're like the conversation you would have if you were in a classroom for three hours one night a week because it's uh, for graduate programs that's often how it's structured and i think the the key things in the um what makes for that successful engagement there's a couple things one is to make sure the prompts are open-ended, which I'm sure you know we all do just as a way of facilitating our classes. Um, but a couple of things that I think are really important. One is faculty presence. I've noticed that the learners show up more regularly when they see faculty comments. It doesn't mean that our faculty is writing volumes. It just means we're commenting on what they're talking about so they know that we're there and that, that does a lot to keeping people engaged. Um, the other thing, and this one's really hard. I have not yet mastered how to encourage this. I like to encourage the learners to change the subject line when they're changing the topic so that it's easy to kind of track the flow of the conversation. They don't do that. They almost all do reply and then we end up with a long string of the same subject line. So I try and model that for them. And one reason that's important is if you've read something interesting, you wanna get back to it, having a different subject line is really helpful for that. And then the last thing I'll mention on discussion forums is we often um, put the learners into small groups. So they might be, depending upon the class and the dynamics of the particular cohort, it might be eight people or it might be seven people, except like four people, depending also on the work we want them to do. Because with a, a larger class, if everybody's in the same form, by the time they've read everything, they don't have a lot of time and energy left to comment. So if they're only responsible for reading and commenting on four, five, six other learners, then the conversation tends to get a little bit deeper. Um, and then we just mix those groups up each week so they have an opportunity to participate with other people in the classes. Um, and then my name is also next to rubrics and I'll just connect this to the discussion forms, which is we have a, um, we have what we call our um, performance expectations and we, we want people, and it sets like how often they come on during the week. So in order to have the asynchronous conversation would be conversational. We ask people to come on by Tuesday evening and then later in the week and then close it out over the week. And so there, the conversation is flowing throughout the week. Because if, if we don't encourage that, then everybody posts on Sunday night when the week ends and it's kind of like they're all talking to themselves because nobody's back in there responding. So the, that um, we have the number of posts we want them to make. And then we also have it set up with by Tuesday and later. So if, if they're doing eight to 10 posts per week, they're coming in a couple times per week. It, it, that it helps facilitate the conversation as well. And then we also have a description of what we call substantive posts. And we're not, we're really focused on the quality versus the quantity. So we're not looking for people to write essays. Nobody has time to read it. You lose people's attention. Um, we would count as up post one where somebody asks a really good question that moves the conversation along. We're not going to count like, oh, Kristen, great idea. Um, that's not going to work. But Kristen, I really like the idea because, and here's how it connects to what I was noticing. And so just kind of that way of facilitating conversation is another piece that we, um, we look for. And so we're really clear with folks around, here's the expectations for posting and here's what it looks like. Um, so I'll stop now so we have time to hear from other people unless there's questions that people want to ask. I actually have a question, Marguerite. I've wanted, I've tried to use more forums, you know, in my classes and I've mm -hmm. been, I've been successful by some things you said about putting students in groups. I like that idea. Um, how many, how many responses do you expect, expect them to post? So what are the expectations around like, you know, you, you post your own entry and then you comment on so many other students. Like, is there some sort of guideline for that? 
Um, we generally ask them to do eight to 10 posts per week and at least three of them are substantive. They almost all do more than that, okay. um, at least on the substantive side. The, and that would depend too, Kristen, on how we, what the activity is for the week. I mean, if they're if it's starting with people sharing kind of a more detailed post in the beginning, we may not look for a lot after that, but if they're responding to our prompts, um, it's, but we're more interested actually in multiple times per week because that's where the engagement comes in. So yeah. if I post on a Monday in response to a faculty prompt, and then I come back in on Wednesday and we're all in the same class and you all have posted something, then there's material there for me to go back and comment on. And how do you enforce that they go in so many times a week and that they don't all do it at the last moment? You know what I mean? Well, <laughs> Um, Carl has heard me complain about this. <laughs> it's hard to track participation in Moodle. Um, you can, there's a participation report where you can see how many times people have posted and how many times they viewed. And I generally check it. Like if we tell everyone the first post by Tuesday, I check that Wednesday morning just to see who was there. Um, and then I just kind of track it through the week. And if somebody's slow, then I go to the individual page and I look through the logs for that person and I can see when they've been on. Um, we're really upfront with the students. We tell them they don't wanna get an email from us kind of nagging them to participate. We'd rather be engaged with them in the forums than paying attention to who's posted. But um, that's the more challenging part of the whole thing, especially for a bigger class. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it definitely does, thanks. Yeah. And to your um, first thing with um, Ellen and I's fencing class during Jan term, we commonly uh, have, require the students to make one original post and then require two responses to other students' posts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the important thing on that, Carl, is the clarity. It's like, here's the expectation so they know actually what it is. And, and Aaron, I see your comment about waiting till the end of the week. Um, we tell them that, you know, they're, um, we try not to be too heavy handed about it, but if they're coming in at the end of the week, they're going to get an email from us partway through the class saying you're, you're not meeting the criteria for engagement. So we talk about engagement versus participation. Participation is kind of like you show up for class engagement is you show up for class and you talk. Um, and for us, that talking happens over the course of the week. So. Anyway, there's a long list of other topics here on the asynchronous chat room, so I'm going to be quiet so other people can talk. Carl, on the agenda, it looks like you're next with pre recorded lectures. Do you want to go first? Oh, you're muted. Um, I wonder if I should just show the because uh, uh, the pre-recorded lecture um, using the interactive video. So let me get. So um, what I actually did because we did our fencing class um, uh, exclusively online, except for um, giving out and getting back weapons. Um, I did an expanded version of my, here's our, here's my introduction to footwork. And what I did is I put it into a, um, um, an interactive video using H5P. So I'm going to come over here, do, 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 share my screen. Here we go. Did it in my yard here. Um, and in this particular case, I used the Zoom recording tools for this. I didn't use Loom or, um, or Zoom. I used, I used Echo 360 just to kind of try it out. And I found that it worked out pretty well. You know, um, one of the things that with Echo 360 is you can get both the, um, the screen of the classroom and the view of the professor. In this particular case, it just needed to do me. And with the interactive video, you see along the bottom of the screen here, there is these little circles. 
And these are where there's a question. So I'm gonna fast forward here. Well, maybe 14 inches in my case, but you get the idea. And so I have it set up so that it stops the video, asks the question. Uh, I'm gonna get this one right. And then says, okay, you can continue on. Stance. The a couple of things about these videos is that it's important to not obsess over making them perfect. It's okay if there's a few ahs and ums or you repeat something a little bit. Um, in part because it keeps you from going crazy trying to get it perfect, and in part because it shows like a, a little bit of humanity that you've made a mistake and that's okay. And so that makes it uh, easier for the students. Um, and the other way that's commonly done is using Loom or something for screen capture, where you um, put up your presentation and you record your lecture. You may or may not have your own face down in the corner. Um, uh, I think the, the scattering report is that in most cases, it's better to have your face there down in the corner, kind of like they do with the YouTube videos a lot. Um, but it kind of depends on the material. And for example, if it's a face-to-face -face class where you're doing this in addition to the face-to-face -face time, then it's less important because they already know what your face looks like. In a hybrid class where they see you, where they physically see you less often, that might be a little bit more important. Um, and I think I've hit most of the highlights there. Um, so I'm going to stop at this point and uh, see who has any questions or comments about this. I think Laura has a question in the chat. Uh, let's see if I can find yeah, I'll just be, I'll take the, because it's, I got 360 um, in terms of doing your uh, questions. Yeah, you get, um, I'll kind of grab your screen, Carl, if you don't mind, just so people can. Yeah, hang on. There we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you have five different um, polling options to kind of add in. So these are the five we have right now, uh, multiple choice, uh, and that can be multiple select as well. Um, short answer, right? That's gonna be the kind of uh, open-ended response. Image poll is gonna be like, label this image, say of the United States, label, label that image. Ordering is kind of reordering and then that numerical is the number. We're always looking at kind of adding to these. So always interested in feedback on, uh, this is a feature we're building out a lot more uh, as this continues. Sorry, I thought there was, was there, is that a raised hand there for me or is that, okay. I've gotten uh, a fair amount of feedback from these uh, interactive videos demonstrating the, the fencing and um, uh, the students generally seem to like it. One of the characteristics, because my class is a Jan term class, it's short. so. I require them to actually watch some of these videos before the first class session. So they get that uh, email during fall term saying, hey, there's gonna be some stuff you're gonna do. And so there's uh, um, one or two of these um, interactive video quizzes before even the first class session. And that allows us to hit the ground running. And, and, and in our case, because it's a fencing class and sometimes the students aren't that um, comfortable with martial arts or stabbing people, um, just, you know, seeing this and going through it themselves a little bit on their own really made them feel more comfortable once we got into the gym and got weapons in our hands and started poking people. Claudine, do you have your hand up for a question? Excellent. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to say something, if I may, regarding the Loom app. Um, one of the things that I find beneficial is not only can you create videos, um, you can also get a response via video in case that the student has a question. They'd say, okay, yes, I saw this portion in the video, but I have a question about ABC. Is there something that you can help me with? That's one of the things that I really, really love about Loom. It's, it's a great way for somebody to look over your shoulder for the smallest things. I mean, you can't just do it for every little thing, but just whatever, you, you know, whenever you have something big. And it, I find it to be a very, very useful tool. And I also find it useful in terms of a 
of an office setting, suppose if your boss gives you something and you have a deadline and you're not sure about how you want to approach it. And it's, it's a really good way for them to look over your shoulder just to see, okay, well, this is, this is what I want. No, that's not what I want. Gina, do you want to talk about the library next? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Excellent. All right. So, um, and my colleague Josh Rose is here uh, too. He's the science librarian um, and the librarian for English and also the um, head of research and teaching services for the library. And um, so one asynchronous tool that you might want in your toolbox is uh, sharing videos with your class. And so we just wanted to make sure everyone knows the videos that are available through the library. Um, so I'll go ahead and um, share my screen. So I'll show you how to get to them and just like some samplings of different kinds of content that are uh, on there. If you have a particular question about video content for your discipline, I'm happy to take that, but I may also refer you to your subject librarian. Um, we've got a whole bunch of different databases and different content in each one, um, but I'll show you how you can poke around yourself. So sharing screen, great. Um, so starting on the library homepage, a couple easy ways to, to get to our videos are, um, first of all, if you want to, if there's a particular video that you have in mind and you wanna see if the library has it, it's a good idea to go to the library catalog. You can search for search in this big search box up at the top, but library catalog can be a little more direct sometimes because this big search box will bring up articles and all kinds of other stuff on your topic. So, you know, I've been watching the Asian Americans series on PBS. Um, and so maybe uh, I want my students to watch that too. And they may not all have a PBS passport subscription. So uh, in that case, oops. Um, so in that case, I would wanna search for the video. You'll see books and stuff are coming up too, but you can narrow down your search to just videos streaming. If you want to provide a streaming link to your students and see if the library has it. Um, so you'll see a, the variety of types of video content that we have. We have a lot of uh, counseling and education videos in here. So those of you from KSOE might be interested in exploring that further after today. Um, but you'll see we do have the Asian Americans uh, ser different series in one of our platforms. So you can click on just stream this video and it'll take you to um, our Alexander Street platform directly. Um, and each of these platforms has a different way to share the video with your students. Some of our platforms have ways that you can um, create clips. You'll see here, there's uh, different clips that are already pre-made from this video. And you could create a playlist of different clips from different videos if you want and share those with your students. Um, You'll want to, it's, it's a good idea to look for the sort of sharing information with a permalink or permanent link, um, or even an embed code if you want to embed it directly in Moodle, so that uh, you're not just copying the link at the top of your screen. It's better to have a share option within whatever video database you're using. Um, so that's how you can find a particular video if there's one that you know you have in mind by title, or you just want to search across the library's different databases of videos. Um, but if there's a particular database of videos that you want to browse, um, I find kind of the easiest ways to go to our FAQs down here, which a lot of folks may not notice are there, but under research help on our homepage, if you click on FAQs, there's all kinds of great um, answers to commonly asked questions throw streaming in there. And this FAQ on how do I find streaming videos through the library um, is a good way to get to browse our collections of streaming films and also a rem reminder about how to go to the library catalog and search for streaming video. So I'm gonna browse our different collections of streaming films. You'll see we have six different databases that have videos in them. Um, so if you, choose one and want to just browse around with the different content that's in there. 
Um, you'll see they have a lot of different sort of featured playlists or collections, um, like the best of Ken Burns or um, videos on music, a closer look at Mars. You can browse through those. You could do a search at the top for a particular topic, or you can go to the menus and actually browse by subject. So there's a lot of folks in education in here. You can see they've got 912 videos just in this one database on curriculum and instruction, 515 videos on sort of foundational concepts, um, 246 that are more on the psychology, the child development or motiv motivation side of education. Uh, and a hundred different videos on special education. So those are some of the ways that you can browse through our different collections. Um, I'll stop sharing now. You'll notice that one of the collections that came up in the list is called Canopy, and that has a lot of really popular content. Um, it's got some amazing documentary films um, or even popular feature films like Moonlight. The one issue I will say with Canopy is unlike the others where we pay a, a flat fee um, for like, you, you know, no matter how many videos people watch, we know this is how much we owe the database company um, each year. Canopy charges us basically per stream. So every time one video gets three, stream, three streams, we get hit with a huge bill for the streaming video that only we can only use for a year usually. And then they'll charge us again the next year if it get watched, gets watched three times again. So I just say that to say, um, if you could stream for academic purposes only when you're using Canopy and if you're assigning some to your students, maybe pick a couple for them to watch instead of like, letting them watch what browse through Canopy and watch any of a dozen videos. And then if we get charged for all 12 videos that our Canopy budget runs out sooner. Um, and so just wanted to make y'all aware of that. Um, yeah, but yeah, Carl uses uh, one of the, uh, one of our movies on Canopy. It's a really user-friendly platform. There's a lot of great stuff on there. Um, and we appreciate that you use that one video and have your whole class watch the same one. Um, <laughs> So, but if you have any concerns about, is your canopy streaming okay? Or do we have different, uh, a, a video for your uh, particular course? We're happy to answer um, any questions about that. Your subject librarian can often source, um, can sometimes source streaming videos for you. If there's something that's on Hulu or Prime or sometimes Netflix, um, we might be able to look into whether we can get it through one of our platforms in the library. It's rare that that's available. Uh, usually they have exclusive licenses with some of these streaming companies, but um, sometimes, uh, sometimes we can get a, a version that we can show through the library. So it's worth asking. Um, and in addition to that, I also wanted to quickly, I don't wanna take up too much time, but um, throw some additional teaching resources in the chat. Um, so um, I just put together a doc that reminds you that we have research guides for every single subject that are great things you can share with your students for them to explore asynchronously. Uh, we also have over 200 article databases, uh, relevant ones for your discipline will be linked on your research guide. And so you can um, link to readings that are in those article databases to have your students read um, on Moodle. And the easiest way to do that is to go, uh, or one easy way to do that is to use our electronic reserve service. Um, there is also, I don't know if anyone here is from SEBA, but uh, we've got some great collections of business case studies that are available if you wanna have your students read and work on those asynchronously. We have citation style guides and also some video tutorials that our librarians have made or that we've licensed um, to help guide your students through the research process. And of course, synchronously or asynchronously, we are available online to help. Um, and so I, I link to that page where your students can get, you or your students can get in touch with us um, via chat, text, Zoom, or email. So, um, Josh, is there anything else you wanted to add for uh, your science folks or um, anything else you want to mention? Uh, no, I'm, I think you covered it very well. So, but uh, yes, I'm happy to answer any questions from anybody that has questions as well. Any questions or, or um, su suggestions for using video 
in your classes. I think these are great resources you've provided, Gina. I'm definitely going to start using videos more often. <laughs> Good. And hi, Shannon's here, one of, another one of my colleagues from the library. Um, so yeah, that's great. And we sent also sent out an email to the faculty listserv um, last week with more, all these uh, links to the different video databases again. Um, so feel free to refer back to that if needed or just contact the subject librarian. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. Aaron, would you like to talk about using group projects? Sure. Um, so I'm, I mostly have one sort of strategy to talk about, but but I guess I could briefly touch on two other ones. Um, those two, Marguerite already kind of talked about using sort of groups in conjunction with discussion forums, and so I've done I've done that before, um, where I have uh, you know like create a small group and then create a, a sub forum for each group and then they do you know uh they discuss among that group around a particular topic um or they'll do like response papers so somebody writes a response paper to they all write response papers to a reading and then they have to like go one name over and from their name and respond to that person's response paper with another response paper so it gets them doing sort of short writing stuff um and then, and then what Gina was talking about with case studies, I've also done some case study stuff um, with small groups uh, where they read a case study um, and then they have to meet in a group, you know, so on their own at some other point outside of class to come up with a response to um, that case study. So like, what would they do in that particular situation? So I, I was using, I think Harvard uh, Business Public um, case studies and I created like a special course packet um, with some uh, of these case studies. Um, but the more successful, I think like longer term asynchronous thing I did um, just in the fall, <clears throat> mostly out of necessity, which I think was probably where a lot of us came up with things, um, was to create like a, a semester long group project. Um, and it was sim similarly a, sort of a case study idea. It was like an applied research project. So I wanted them to come up with a kind of case and then work together as a group to research uh, ways to kind of make an intervention into that case and then present a prototype intervention um, as if they were like pitching this to some group. Um, so, you know, the, the class itself that I did this in uh, was a graduate hybrid class. So it was uh, like, it's a part of our four plus one in communication where it's intercultural communication. So the the students are undergrads, but they're doing graduate level work as an introduction to going on to, to maybe do graduate uh, study at, for a master's degree. Um, and so the, the class was communication and culture. We're looking at theories of communication and theories of culture, and I wanted them to apply theories to real world situations. And so I gave them a bunch of like examples, things like, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, anti-Black violence, police violence or police brutality. Um, thinking about, you know, uh, implicit bias, um, you know, probably if I was doing it right now, I would talk about like, uh, you know, anti-Asian and Asian American racism. Um, we talked about like immigration as an issue. Um, and my students, the, the different groups chose interracial dating, which I'm still surprised that's the thing that they really want to talk about. Um, but that's awesome. So that was one of the one of the social issues. Um, another one was about um, sort of, yeah, like uh, police brutality, but really more sort of Black Lives Matter and, and thinking about like anti-Blackness and, and racism more broadly. Um, and then another group would want to talk about um, immigration. And so then, then they had to, to come up with like a lit review and a sort of annotated bibliography as a group where they came up with like, here's a bunch of sources that we think are gonna be really good. And then they created a timeline for doing the reading and every, you know, they had like three sessions where they would read like four articles per session, come together and talk about it. And I would show up to those in the beginning to kind of check in with them and ask them about those readings. So they were mostly doing this stuff on their own as a group, um, but then I would come in and kind of help structure it and help them learn how to have those conversations as a small group. Um, and then similarly, I sort of check in around midterm to say, okay, what are you kind of learning out of what the research you've done? 
what kinds of interventions might you be able to come up with? So the interracial dating group came up with this idea of doing like an advice blog um, that created sort of scenarios that they could talk through the scenarios about like, you're dating somebody um, who's Muslim and what's that gonna be like um, to have that kind of conversation. Um, the immigration group ended up coming up with a intervention where they wanted to, they were kind of imagining taking high school students like border crossing trip um, from both sides of the border and bringing them together to kind of have a conversation. And so they created a prototype of like the first conversation that you would have um, when all those students came together. Um, and so in the end of the class in the final, like the final for the class was delivering a presentation that for the class walked them through that prototype. So we sat down to sort of like discuss as if we were those high school students. Um, and so it was all meant to be applied so that they could take this and bring it to a, a sort of potential employer in the future to say, look, I've designed a program um, or I've designed this product based on trying to, to make an intervention in a, in a social problem. So that was kind of what we did. And it allowed me to get them meeting for about an hour a week that was, you know, using some of our class contact time. Questions about that? I have a question. How do you um, facilitate the group roles? I'm assuming each student sort of has a role in the group or is that not the case? Um, they, I mean, these these were groups of like three to four students because I didn't really have a super oh, okay. big class. Um, so I didn't really have to do that, but I I've, I've have colleagues that do do that pretty effectively. Um, and they, they'll do something like, you know, if you're doing three of these uh, particular kinds of meetings, like, you know, each time you have to have, you know, two recorders and one whatever, um, and then they switch it off and they have to create a Google Doc. Um, so all of them in, in my thing, they created a Google Doc. And so I could also follow along with their progress in these Google Docs. Um, so you could do something like that, where they're turning in along the way Google Docs that sort of account for their roles. Okay, yeah, that um, makes sense. Yeah, it takes, it takes like coordination and, and creating a structure that they have to follow, I think, is usually the success with a lot of this asynchronous stuff, as yeah. Marguerite said too, with the discussion forums. Yeah. 